Nuclear power projects are popping up all over the world, but is it really a good investment choice given the cost that we've been seeing? Or is it that, in some cases, you're probably better off burning your money rather than investing in nuclear? That's what we're going to talk about today. Now to start, I'm pretty afraid of spiders, but there's nothing more frightening to a pro-nuclear advocate than an accountant. So let's go through some basic economics to show why nuclear's investment looks like this, while renewables look like this. But before we get into that, we need to understand some basic economics terminology. Starting with capital costs, which are basically just the physical costs to build a facility, we move on to operating costs, which are the parts to run your operation, like labor or fuel. Now imagine we had a plot of land at our factory and we wanted to build something new there. How do we determine what's best to build? Well, that moves us towards net present value, which helps us determine the time value of money to estimate the value of a project in today's dollars, because money now is always worth more than money later. To determine the degree at which money now is more than money later, we use something called a discount rate. This is basically the rate at which the money is devalued over time. So a higher number means that you need faster returns. A good starting point is usually comparing your project to simply putting your money in the stock market. So usually around 7 or 8% is a good starting point. So let's do a simple example to show you what I mean. Imagine you gave me $100, and I say I can return you $150 over the course of three years or six years. Intuitively, we know that three years is better, but if your discount rate is 0%, then in both cases, you receive $50 in the end. This is why a discount rate is so important. However, if we use a 7% discount rate, you can see that the net present value is $29 in the three-year case and $18 in the six-year case, mathematically showing what we intuitively know. The chart on the left here would be your cash flow, which is just the amount of money you make after all of your other costs, be it capital costs, operating costs, or interest payments on the total capital that was required to build your facility. The final term we're going to look at is called the internal rate of return. This is the actual rate that you want your investment to grow at, so higher is better. You can think of it as the percent of time it takes you to pay off your capital costs and how quickly you're going to be making back like pure profit. This is going to drive a lot of your decision making for a capital project, and it's completely independent of discount rates. Basically, the higher the IRR, the quicker you get your return on investment back. That's what we care about. So you can see here, if we want our return on investment to be the same, you actually need to get a lot more cash flow out of your six-year case versus your three-year case. Again, because money now is worth more than money later. So in order to get 23% across the board, you're probably going to have to return about $200 total instead of $150 total. So your overall return can make up for the difference in faster returns. So putting this more practically, if I gave you the option to build two different operations where one had a higher NPV but a lower rate of return, but the other had a lower NPV and a higher rate of return, which are you going to select? But in the simple case, option two is what you would pick without a doubt. But economic value for our power grids is more than just money. It's also reliability of that grid. We need to balance the economics with the stability. Fundamentally, we want to have maximum reliability at the lowest cost possible. That's our goal with the power grid, because power is so fundamental to the rest of the economy. So we need to balance the economics with stability when we think about this problem. In this video, we're just focusing on the economics, but in subsequent ones, we'll look at stability. To do the economic comparison between solar and wind with batteries and nuclear, I use the 2024 version of Lazard economic analysis. I tested over a dozen scenarios to see what it would take for nuclear to compete with solar and wind with battery storage head to head. Note that the 2024 study looked primarily at multiple kinds of battery storages, which is why the spread is so high. However, using the 2023 study, which only looked at longer storage times, you can see that the spread is much smaller especially for solar, which looks terrible when you have one hour battery storage. Anyway, moving on to the comparison, I'm using average wind and solar capacity factors with four hours of storage. The economics will look a little bit more like the 2023 case. I only point this out because I know there's gonna be raging nuclear stands furiously typing in the comments who have never read either of these studies. Four hours of battery storage is the utility minimum and the one that I quote constantly on this channel. So that's what we're using. Moving on from there, we're gonna use the same initial assumptions that Lazard used. The OPEX includes variable and fixed operating costs. Note that for doing this analysis, we're looking at the net present value over 60 years, and I'm assuming that renewables need to be repowered every 20 years. But that's not hugely important when we're talking about the economic life, because the first 20 years, nevertheless, are going to be the most important for investor returns. This analysis is for the United States only, so everything is in USD. To match the cash flows, I assume the same total energy generation of 18 terawatt hours per year, meaning capacity factors have been included. So let's get right to our chalkboard. As you can see here, we have our cash flows of solar, then wind, then nuclear. Wait a minute. Nuclear looks really good. It has a longer startup due to higher capital costs. And once depreciation credits wear off, it's still very positive. Then after 25 years, the capital is paid off and it goes to the moon. Does this mean that I'm wrong then? And I should just concede the debate I'm going to have? Yeah, capital costs are right. Net present value looks incredible. Oh, Oh yeah, one small little thing. You see, to achieve a 12% IRR, 
on your equity, like the Lazard study states, basically the capital you raise through investments, you have to have a much higher charging rate of $142 per megawatt hour, or about double that of solar and wind. So let's just erase this here and see what happens when nuclear competes on the free market. I'm sure it'll be fine. Let's just add some free market costs right here. I've let nuclear be a little bit higher to account for transmission costs, which lets it be an extra $8 per megawatt hour. I provided more details on this in my Substack post. Now let's check on the NPV. Oh, and as we kind of expected, NPV is negative compared to the other two. What about just cash flows? Yeah, can't even break even. We look at his IRR and it's 1%. So now maybe it makes sense why investors aren't super excited to compete with renewables in liberalized energy markets where you have to compete on the free market. But what happens if nuclear costs are lowered to its 2035 estimates at $5,000 a kilowatt? This largely strips away regulation and other red tape that's plagued nuclear reactors for decades. Surely by 2035, nuclear will be competitive. Same prices as before, but better capex. And after 32 years, it looks like the cash flows of nuclear might beat out wind. With a lifetime NPV, half that of wind and a third that of solar, with a 9% IRR, truly, truly impressive. In 11 years, nuclear might almost be on par with renewables today if you squint hard enough. Now we've given nuclear the benefit of the doubt, but what happens if we do that to renewables? Well, look at my optimistic case. The National Renewable Laboratories don't see this happening till 2050, though with the meteoric fall in prices that we've seen in renewables, I would not be surprised to see these costs by 2035. And if I'm an investor, these are probably the costs I'd want to compare myself to. As a nuclear facility takes at least five years to build, imagine finishing construction just to be priced out of the market immediately. Anyway, with a cost reduction of about 50%, a lot of which is by batteries coming down in cost through the use of iron, air, and sodium ion batteries. More about that in later videos. We're heading back to the drawing board to see what happens. Similar prices, but now transmission lines have the benefit of cutting all of the red tape. More of that on my Substack post as well. And it goes about as well as you'd expect. Nuclear can't even break even. The NPV is completely in the gutter. Sorry, nuclear, welcome to the free market. Again, renewables are not something I want to bet against. Now you might be saying, D-cubed, you're an asshole, you're just poking fun at nuclear. Yes, riling up nuclear power advocates is fun and very, very easy. Let me show you what nuclear power costs need to be to compete with the optimistic case that I provided. $1,650 per kilowatt, with operating costs being cut in half. Now you might say, hey, D-cubed, you're just some Greenpeace hippie liberal shill and I don't trust a word out of your mouth. Okay, fair enough then trust the pro-nuclear institutions like the IEA and the Nuclear Energy Agency and see what they have to say. To compete directly with solar and wind power, the costs need to be reduced to $2,000 per kilowatt for capacity to be added by 2030. This is right in line with the estimate that I'm providing. If we want nuclear costs to come down and be competitive, you better pray that is very quick. The future for renewables is bright and vibrant and huge. But if nuclear can't compete, if nuclear can't do all these things that we want it to do, it's living on borrowed time. 2030 is going to be very telling. And things aren't looking good for nations that have autocratic regimes and can sidestep much of the regulatory burden already in the West. Chinese reactor, Russian reactor, Russian reactor, Argentinian reactor. Expected times to deploy? Three to four years. What were they actually? 12 to 13 years. My analysis isn't some anti-nuclear rhetoric. I'm trying to give it the best chance possible, but we need to be honest with ourselves and honest with the chances it has. I'm gonna leave you with one last piece. This is solar power's learning rate. Basically what it shows is that for every doubling of install power for solar, the costs were reduced by 20%. That is ridiculously impressive. So how does this map on to nuclear power? If we start at $10,000 a kilowatt for nuclear in the US, which is fair given the expected prices of recent SMR projects, and studies suggesting around 30% of nuclear's costs being due to the regulatory burden, I think it's a pretty good start. So if nuclear's learning rate is like solar, then it looks like the curve on this chart. To get down to $2,000 per kilowatt by 2030, that's around 100 gigawatts of SMRs built, or $0.15 trillion. That's realistically, Nothing. And I hope it happens. I hope this is the case that nuclear gets to have, because that would be amazing. But again, we need to temper our expectations. What if its rate is more like wind at 12%? Well, now we're looking at $4.3 trillion. What if learning rates are down at 7%, which is predicted by many nuclear organizations? And let's be honest, contrary to history, which has showed negative learning rates throughout most of it, then you're looking at costs in the 165 trillion or more. It goes off the chart. So the question becomes, is burning your money a better investment than nuclear? Well, that depends a lot on our learning rate and how fast prices fall for renewables. Because I misled you with this chart at the beginning of the video. 
I left out some data. At the end down here, we have battery storage, whose investment has been very similar to nuclear, but holy shit have its costs fallen. Now we're just seeing the start of battery storage, and I'd be terrified as a nuclear power company because we're already seeing exponential growth in that sector. If battery prices come down to some predictions, my transmission argument stops being valid, let alone the argument against nuclear. It's important to understand what this data is telling us. I think it's very unlikely that nuclear will compete with renewables head to head, but that doesn't mean it won't have a place in grid stability or hydrogen production. This analysis definitely softened my position on nuclear. I think we should work towards making it easier to build and spend more public resources on it, even if it's not the best economic choice in every case, because the potential that the learning rate is much higher than expected is probably worth the trade-off. The pro-nuclear argument seems to be more relative to transmission lines. The battle we'll cover next time. Now that we've seen what nuclear needs to do to be competitive, let's see if that's even remotely possible or feasible. This is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's cost estimations, and the case you're seeing on screen is for 2035. We're going to focus on coal, natural gas, and nuclear for this, since all of these systems are just steam engines. You create heat and then warm up water and put that through a turbine. So for estimating costs and what the cost could potentially be for nuclear, coal and natural gas are going to give us really good proxies since they all do essentially the same thing. Well, nuclear requires about two times the critical minerals. It requires about the same amount of concrete and steel, but we know it's also more complex and has higher safety requirements. Yes, we can argue that some of the protocols are overzealous, but I don't see nuclear making much headway if their tagline is Nuclear costs have come down thanks to lower safety regulations. So I believe that the 2035 estimates are very fair, having nuclear a little bit higher than coal. And after that, I think it's really fair to assume the 2050 case of just under $3,000 per kilowatt. But nevertheless, all these values are far cry away from the sub $2,000 per kilowatt that's required. This looks a lot more like the 7% cost reduction case than the 20%. I'm hoping I'm wrong. Having another decarbonization tool in the tool belt would be awesome, but that doesn't mean we get to just believe or make up whatever we want just because it makes us feel good. Nuclear has positives, but it also has drawbacks, the number one being cost. And I'm unconvinced that its cost will be competitive with renewables given the data I've presented here and what other institutions that are pro-nuclear have said. The reason I showed concrete, steel, copper, critical minerals, etc., is because those are the physical inputs that you need to build the facility. And when you compare those to natural gas and coal, it's still just too expensive. One final note though, this only gets us to around 80 to 90% variable renewable energy, solar and wind. Nuclear may not have to compete on the free market if its job is to provide firm load power, peaker, or backup energy demand for renewables. But this means it's playing second fiddle and it's not the primary lifter. It also means that its capacity factor is probably gonna be somewhere between 20 and 60%, not 95%, which is what I assumed across this analysis. This leads me to the debate that I'm having on this topic next week, on July 17th at 4 p.m. MST, on WIC TV's YouTube and Twitch channel, all of which is linked in the description below. Really, our disagreement, though, is between nuclear providing about 20% of global energy demand, where I think the value is closer to 5%, or approximately a doubling of the existing nuclear fleet by 2050, assuming that energy demand increases from about 30,000 terawatt hours to 80,000 terawatt hours by that point. And if your only argument against my position is that I use a common pronunciation of nuclear that you don't like, then you probably don't have any real arguments against what I've stated. Feel free to look up the term common use. Anyway, follow me for more if you're interested in decarbonization, deadlifting, or Dungeons & Dragons. Thanks.